You're watching Fugitive Red Eye, and, wel and welcome to another TV show review. Today I'll finally get around to reviewing Succession, which is a series I've been watching with my friend Rem for quite some time now. Now, as you guys probably know, I often don't like a lot of new shows that are coming out. However, Succession is a new show that I like so much that I decided to do a whole video about new media I don't hate, mainly because of it. Although I also talked about Invincible and a couple other things. Uh, this video will contain spoilers, however, I'm gonna give a brief outline at the start without the spoilers, just to kind of, uh, give an idea for people who may want to kind of have an idea of what it is without having it spoiled, uh, and then I will tell you when I'm getting into the spoiler section. Uh, so... Keeping it brief, what the show is about is about a company called Waystar Royco, which is owned by a guy named Logan Roy. Now, Logan Roy is this ruthless businessman who gets shit done and uh, is pretty cold and distant a lot of the time, but he knows how to fucking get shit done. Uh, and then he has four children, uh, Connor, Kendall, Roman, and Shaban. And uh, each of those kids are neurotic and fucking flawed in their own way, and they all definitely have a lot of Logan's traits. I would say Connor is the most mature and the most well-adjusted, but that's ironically because he's the most distant from the family, which is really sad. Uh, the show also brings in their cousin, Logan's great-nephew, uh, Greg, and then Shaban is also engaged to a guy named Tom. Now, each of these characters have their own motivations and all of them want to take over the company. The whole point of the show is Logan wants to name a successor who will take his place as CEO of the company. And each character has their own schemes for how they're gonna do it. Uh, another key detail is uh, Logan's health is declining. He's very clearly got some form of dementia. Uh, in season one especially, you see it really early on, you see a lot of it happening right at the beginning, and so obviously naming a successor is something important. There's also some cover-ups and things about the company that are going on that are definitely concerning for people involved in the company. Uh, there's some stuff with cruises, which we'll get to a little bit later when I actually start getting into spoilers. But the show becomes a bunch of scheming and plotting and family drama while these people are trying to fight for control of the company. Uh, you know, there's also buyouts. Uh, mergers and all sorts of other stuff that get attempted and go through depending on which one it is like there's plenty of plans that happen some of which fall flat some of which go through another key detail of the show is it really likes to hit you with unexpected curveballs. I'll go into it a little bit more later when I get into the spoilery part, but the show does a very good job at ma making you think the plot's going in one direction, only to hit you with a curveball and go in a completely different direction. The show itself is a dramedy, but it definitely leans more into the drama category than a lot of dramedies do. It's got a lot of funny jokes in it, it's also got really good drama, it's also fucking tragic as hell, there's a lot of really sad moments. The show started in 2018, and ended just last year in 2023. It ran for four seasons with a total of 39 episodes, 10 episodes a season with the exception of season three, which only had nine. I think something that sets this show apart from a lot of other modern shows is all of the characters are Machiavellian, self-centered, rich fucking assholes who all do some pretty bad things. But the show always humanizes them, it never dehumanizes them, it always goes out of its way to make them sympathetic, despite the fact that they're really not that good of people, which is something I really like about this show, because a lesser show would just make them these big bad evil sociopaths with no redeeming qualities. But this show, no, it actually makes them much more complex, and makes you feel for these pieces of shit, and makes you actually, like, really empathize with them. It does a good job at pointing out the fact that even though these guys have all the money in the world, they still have huge problems which I think is great, because rich people tend to get hated on by a lot of people in modern society, mostly because of fucking retarded commie takes that people have, and, uh, I think it's really refreshing to see a show that doesn't completely demonize these people, even when it has them doing some pretty terrible shit at times. The show itself definitely has a leftist slant, and there's no denying that when you watch it, which, you know, obviously that can be a put-off for me. I think it's actually not that bad in this show. There's obviously some stuff that I fucking roll my eyes at, you know, like, they definitely overplay, like, how prominent, you know, fascistic ideals are and stuff like that. Like, they use the term fascist, like, a lot. Uh, it definitely has its slant, but it does show 
both sides to be a piece of shit. It definitely over amplifies the right being bad more than the left. It does still make the left bad though, so that is at least good uh, that it is balanced in that regard, but it is very clear where the politics of J Jesse Armstrong, who is the creator of the show, who also created Peep Show, you know, which Peep Show's great as well. So both the shows I've seen from this guy are great. Uh, but even though it has that bias, it's never too in your face with it. And some of the commentary that it has on politics and society are actually fucking spot on. Uh, for instance, it has an episode where uh, politicians are sort of picked uh, by a, by a group, like like by the party, like in primaries, they pick their front runner rather than having it go to the vote. That's something that's gone on for decades. Like, the president has kind of been handpicked for a very long time. Uh, this show also clearly does have some, like, allegories and, like, you know, parallels to, like, Trump and other figures to an extent. Like, there's this character named Mankin, who we'll get to when I get into the spoiler section, that they clearly tried to make a parallel to, to Trump, but this guy's a fucking cartoon character. They made him, like, a literal Nazi. They made him a two-faced snake. But, again, we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, it's, it's a little bit cringe in that, in that there is one episode in particular where it does get a little bit unbearable, but most of the time it's actually fairly even-handed. Most of the time it's actually fairly level-headed and it actually portrays shit in a nuanced way in some regards, and in other regards just kind of makes everybody a piece of shit and is more about how corrupt the system is. Alright, I think that's all I can say without delving into spoilers, so let's get to the spoiler parts. Uh, so things that I fucking love about this show, right? I'm watching it, and early on, I think, oh shit, Logan's gonna die, like, in the first few episodes, I thought, because, you know, he has dementia, he gets bed bedridden really early on, he's clearly not all there for a little bit, and that's mainly in season one, but then, he just kind of miraculously recovers and actually gets back on top. Uh, which is great because Logan is my favorite character. I fucking love Logan. He's played by Brian Cox, who I think is probably the biggest name in this movie. Kieran Culkin's also in there. Uh, as Roman. But yeah, Logan, uh, early on you think, oh, he's probably gonna die within the first few episodes. No, he doesn't. Like, in fact, his kids think he's probably gonna die too. So Kendall actually makes an announcement saying that he's, uh, that he's down for the count, effectively, and says, you know what, we need to, uh, take control. We Roman, you can be CFO, I'll be CEO. Uh, and they try to, like, kind of plot and plan at the start. Uh, to just kind of take over because they don't think he's gonna make it. Logan finds out about this, gets up, and fucking, like, loses his shit. Uh, so then Kendall's like, okay, we need to have a vote of no confidence to get him, like, ousted from his position. Uh, and so then they have the vote of no confidence, and you're seeing it happen and go on, and it's fucking really tense, waiting to see who votes yes and who votes no. And at the end, Kendall fails. And that's a theme. Kendall always has these plans where it seems like he's going to succeed, and he always, without fail, fails. Like, it's funny, he fails without fail. Like, last moment, you think he's gonna fucking win, and then, nope, he loses. The vote of no confidence was the part that actually really got me into the show. Like, I was gripped from the start, but the vote of no confidence was the episode I realized, oh yeah, this is gonna be a really good show. Uh, and so that after that point, I was hooked. Uh, but then we get to the season one finale, because we think we know where it's going, right? Logan beats Kendall, Kendall becomes a drug addict, but then still works on a plan to take down Logan, and he starts working with this guy, Stewie, who he also let on the board while he was briefly in control while Logan was sick. And then he starts plotting with this guy, Stewie, after Logan comes back. As he's plotting, uh, you think he's gonna actually go after him, and he, get, he gives him this, like, little letter basically telling him, hey, I'm coming after you. They call it a bear hug. Uh, but then, on the night of Shiv and Tom's wedding, Shiv is what Shaban typically goes by for short, uh, he, he gets high with one of these waiters who's at the wedding, and then th they drive into a fucking lake, and the waiter drowns. So Kendall, like, causes this kid's death, this fucking wait- this young waiter guy, who Logan was also treating like shit prior to them leaving. Uh, and then Logan finds out about it, finds out that Kendall left him in the lake, and then he blackmails Ken into coming back and working with him again, into dropping all of his plans against him, and basically just becoming his puppet. So then we get into season two where Kendall's just this fucking broken husk. And uh, as it progresses, you just see him like just doing everything Logan says. You see you see moments where you think he's plotting to get out of it. But no, it turns out that he's just actually tricking people into thinking that he has his own agenda. Whereas he's actually just doing what Logan wants. Like Logan has him shut down this app that they have called Valter, which I think is a very clear and obvious, like, parody of, uh, Gawker. Then, as all this is going on, season two hits us with a curveball. 
Cruises comes back. So what Cruises is, is there's a cover-up of a bunch of rapes and even a murder uh, that happened on the cruise lines that are owned by Waystar Royco. And uh, initially, you see Greg destroying some papers about it on Tom's behest. Uh, and then uh, you see that one of the girls actually comes forward later on. And so it becomes this whole big legal trial where... Uh, Waystar Royco is in some deep shit with the DOJ and others uh, because of uh, because of the cover-ups. Uh, because there was this guy named Lester who they called Mo, which, you know, Mo Lester, uh, who was doing all sorts of shady shit with girls on the cruise lines. Uh, and uh, he died, but now it's all coming out and they want people to take responsibility. And it becomes this whole big legal case. And eventually... Uh, they're like, we need someone to basically be the scapegoat. And then, uh, eventually, uh, Kendall's going to be the scapegoat, because, you know, he's Logan's puppet, and he agrees to it. But, uh, then Kendall breaks down to Logan about, uh, about the kid he killed. And, uh, L Logan's like, no, 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 son, that doesn't matter. No, that, that you're, you're not a bad person for that. No real person involved. And, uh, that, that's, that's a saying that they had on the cruises as well. NRPI, no real person involved, whenever it involved, like, a prostitute or someone they considered lower status. Well, this pushes Kendall over the edge. So when he goes to give the press conference where he's supposed to take the fall, he throws Logan completely under the bus and turns on him. And that's how season two ends. So, again, this show just hits you with curveball after curveball where you don't expect shit coming. Then in season three, you see Logan actually beat the stuff. Uh, because in season two, Shiv actually convinced one of the uh, victims to actually step down and not testify. And basically through a bunch of negotiating, lawyering, and, you know, basically scapegoating Mo and saying that it was isolated incidents and stuff like that, they're able to get it down to just where they have to pay fines and nobody has to go to prison. Meanwhile, in the interim where they thought someone was going to have to go to prison, Tom actually tells Logan that he's willing to take the fall. Uh, after all of the stuff with the fines and the lawsuits, though, Logan's looking to try and, like, fix the company by doing mergers and buyouts and stuff, and ultimately is going to sell the company to this Swedish guy named Lucas Madsen. Now, none of the siblings want this, so Kendall, Shiv, and Roman actually team up in sort of a united front, which is really cool to see, because they all had been at odds at this point, because they all sided with Logan, and Kendall sided against Logan, but now they're all teamed up against him, and they finally confront him. Uh, but then it turns out Tom actually double-crossed them all and, uh, told Logan about their whole plan. And so then Logan calls their mom and gets it so that they can't use their shares against him because he convinces her to use her shares to override them. And so they're like, okay, we're gonna sell the company. And it becomes this whole big thing at the end of season three. Meanwhile, Kendall, at the end of season three, also breaks down and, like, reveals the fact that he killed a guy to Shiv and Roman, who do their best to console him, but the thing is, none of these people are well-adjusted people. They're all just... They don't know how to be sympathetic. They don't know how to be warm and caring. They try, but it's not just in their nature because they weren't raised in it. It's not in, it's not in them any... They, they were raised in a cold and distant, you know, ruthless family. Uh, but then the biggest curveball, I think, happens three episodes into season four. Because you think you know where it's going. Like, you think, oh, they're gonna build it up. Logan's gonna be the big bad in season four, and then he's probably gonna die at the end. That's what you think, right? Because, you know, his health was a big issue at the beginning. And you think, okay, yeah, it's probably gonna be this big thing and end with him dying. No, he dies on episode fucking three of season four. The crazy part is, at the beginning of season four, they have all of these plans. Everyone has these things in the works and that just throws a fucking wrench into it where everyone drops their plans and the scene where he dies is actually really sad and they make the characters all feel really sad about it it's genuinely great that they make it that the characters actually do care about each other despite all the machiavellian shit that they're constantly doing the remainder of season four becomes about whether or not the deal with lucas madsen still going to go through uh planning for logan's funeral and dealing with the aftermath of his death because again logan's a fucking titan nobody even comes close Throughout the series, Logan was constantly testing out his kids to see if any of them would fit the role of CEO. He's also super good at manipulating them and, like, making them think they're gonna be the one. And, like, uh, he- it's- it's- it's unclear if he ever actually was gonna follow through. But I think he was more or less testing the waters and seeing if any of them would step up to the plate when he makes them promises. It's really fucked up that he constantly made these promises. He Like, he constantly flip-flopped and changed, Oh, Shiv, it's definitely going to be you. Oh, Kendall, it's you. It's Ro Roman, it's, it's gotta be you. 
Uh, and let's talk about Roman a little bit. Roman is constantly, like, joking and smart-assed and wisecracking. Uh, and he's the most sociable of the Roy's children, uh, as far as it comes to, like, making deals with people and dealing with people outside the family. But he definitely doesn't have any tact. Like, he's constantly brash, constantly making light of every situation. But when Logan dies, it fucking destroys him. He's the most affected by it, because, uh, Roman actually was closest to Logan, I would say. Which, uh, you know, he's the youngest son, he's the second youngest overall with Shiv being the youngest. Uh, and it's interesting to see Rogan completely break down. For instance, at Logan's funeral, Roman is fucking destroyed. Like, he tries to give the eulogy, but he just can't. He starts breaking down in tears, and he's like, I can't do it. Uh, similarly to how he reacts when they're talking on the phone with Logan for the last time. Not to mention he sent Logan a message basically asking him if he was a cunt right before Logan died. So imagine if Logan was sitting on the toilet, got that voicemail, was listening to it, and then, like, had a heart attack or a stroke due to the stress. And I'm sure that's something that kept going through Roman's mind since that's the last thing he sent him, and he was on the phone on the toilet when he died. After Logan's death, season four also, you know, things get rapid. At first, they're gonna make the deal with Madsen, then Madsen tries to change the deal, so Roman and Ken are like, fuck Madsen, we're gonna, we're gonna overtake him, we're gonna tank this deal. And, uh, then Shiv kind of turns on them, and then starts helping Madsen, uh, but then, uh... In the end, she goes over to their side, and they're all gonna go against Madsen, because it turns out Madsen was stringing Shiv along, making her think she was gonna be CEO, because, uh, uh, because this guy named Mankin, again, who I, br I briefly mentioned earlier, his name's Jared Mankin, uh, and they make him, uh, as the guy who's running for president, uh, because the original president, who they actually never show in the show, they just call him The Raisin, it decides not to run for re-election. And so Mankin's the guy they choose at the caucus to be, like, the frontrunner for the Republican Party. Uh, and, uh, he is kind of a cartoon, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I have met people with similar beliefs, because, like, he's a white nationalist, they make him an actual Nazi, like... I've met people like this that I actually am friendly with. Like, there's people I know that are that are that, that have these ideas, and like, uh, th this this is a rising movement. But they obviously make him cartoonishly evil, and uh, they make it act they make it seem like this is like everybody on the right too, or like this is like a huge thing on the right. But I will say, in the episodes with the caucus, they actually are pretty good at understanding the different types of people there are on the right. Because there's some neocons, there's some like libertarians, and then there's this guy. All of these are people that I've met, and people that I can get along with, honestly, because I, I can get along with people who have basically any ideology. But they make this guy kind of cartoonish, like, they make him, like, fucking two-faced, and they also, like, make it so that he, he has, so that his campaign has a direct line to their news network, uh, which is pretty fucking cool that they actually go out of their way to make the, the, the news networks, like, fake and stuff, like, like, they, they do go with the fake news thing, although, I think, uh, obviously, I don't think that they go to the degree that, uh, that is actually true. They'd, um, like I said, the commentary, it can be pretty good, uh, and it can also be pretty t fucking tone deaf. Uh, they also make this guy, like, a very clear allegory for Trump during the episode America Decides, which is a night of the presidential election within the story. Uh, that episode is easily, my, like, the worst episode of the show, because it's very clearly an allegory for 2020. Uh, it's interesting, too, because they make the Republican side the bad one that's doing all this stuff, and they make it so that they're the ones committing fraud, but then they also hand-wave away the fraud narrative, uh, that, um, that the Republican side also expresses. Uh, and then they also make it so that, like, uh, fucking people, like, burn down, like, fucking ballots and stuff like that, and, like, they imply that it was probably Mankin's people. Uh, and then, of course, Roman calls it a false flag, but the show kind of seems like it's hand-waving this away as if, like, it's really one-sided. The show also does kind of imply that there's, like, a a larger degree of right-wing, like, extreme violence, which is just a stupid narrative. It's just objectively not true if you actually look at fucking every major riot. None of it's been right-wing except for fucking January 6th, and that's fucking nothing compared to the shit that's, like, the left have done. And, like, January 6th was literally just a bunch of people who got let in by the feds, and, like, also Ray Epps was clearly a fed. The show itself was very tone-deaf on, uh, 2020, I think, and, like, that whole episode being focused on that was cringe. Uh, it was honestly the hardest episode to watch. There were still good moments of the episode. I don't think it's a bad episode of TV, uh, because there is still a lot of things I liked about it, and there were elements of the commentary that I thought were right. And in fact, you could even really twist it if you wanted to try and think of Mencken as sort of a Joe Biden figure, because they have it so that, uh, his guys were, like, burning the fucking ballots, and then, then the networks were calling it for him, uh, and then that leads to, you know him being the presumptive nominee and then it f being battled out in the courts, which is what happened to Trump because, of, like, with Joe Biden, with the fraud in 2020. So it's really funny to me 
<laughs> that, like, they're clearly trying to make this guy an analog for Trump, but you could really twist it and think of it as an analog for Biden, too. Uh, if you really think about it, like, the fucking ballot boxes and shit being burned, you could think of as similar to the pipes bursting in Georgia. You know, shit like that. Um, but obviously that's not what they were going for, because they also have this thing where, like, uh, Shiv saying that every vote needs to be counted, and then Roman's, like, hand-waving it away, saying, oh, no, it doesn't matter, which, again... They're very clearly dismissing the fact that there could have been fraudulent ballots and stuff like that. Like, they ver they hand wave it away, like, a lot. And I think it's really tone deaf and very one-sided. But it it's the only episode where it got to the point that it actually bothered me. Most of the show, that's not an issue. Like, it obviously has its bias at all times. And, you know, periodically there's been a couple of scenes where I've kind of rolled my eyes, but uh, America Decides is easily, like, my, the worst episode. Which is funny, because it was followed up by my all-time favorite episode, Church and State, which is fucking great. Church and State's a great episode. It's about Logan's funeral, and uh, it's really good. Like, it has, you know, each character giving their speech, like Ewan, uh, Logan's brother. Who Let's talk about Ewan a little bit real quick. Uh, Ewan is Greg's grandfather, and uh, him and Logan don't get along. And one of the things I think is fair about the show is Ewan is a leftist guy. He doesn't like Logan's, like, impact on the environment and shit like that. But Ewan is honestly one of the least likable characters in the show, and it's very clearly written to be that way, which I think is great that they'd make a guy like that unlikable, because he's very, like, high and mighty and sanctimonious. Like, he thinks that he's better than Logan, and he, like, constantly goes on and on about the fucking planet and all this other shit and environmental causes, and, uh, he literally is going to give Greg's inheritance to Greenpeace just because Greg, you know, sided with Logan. Uh, and then Ewan gives this speech that I really liked the first half, half at, at, uh, Logan's funeral, where he's talking about his brother and good memories he had with him, but then he goes and he starts talking about how bad of a person Logan was. To be fair, I actually like that too, because it is interesting to see Logan's funeral not just be a puff piece, it's actually acknowledging Logan for the person he was. And then Kendall goes up there and gives a speech about how Logan, you know, he might have been this ruthless guy, but it's what was needed and how he built an empire and stuff like that and how he builds life uh and i think that the speech that he gives is great and how he talks about how you know logan had this terrible force in him and he's like and i by god i hope it's in me too and i think that speech is also great like Everything about Church and State is a fucking great episode, because uh, you also see Roman go up there and try to talk about him, but then he breaks down into tears, which again, every time Roman broke down into tears in season four was fucking heartbreaking, like, I really felt for the character. Uh, and then, uh, let's talk a little bit about Connor before we get to the ending, because I do want to talk about the ending, but I've talked about a lot of the characters, so I feel like I need to talk about Connor, and maybe we'll touch on Shiv a little bit too. So Connor has a different mother than the rest of the sh the Roy children, uh, and his mom was institutionalized by Logan because Logan fucked her over in the divorce and sent her to an institution under false pretenses. Like, Logan's fucking, like, does a lot of bad shit, like I said. He always comes out on top because he's this fucking beast. He's this force of nature. He always gets the better of every situation. Uh, the only thing that could take Logan out was death. Uh, and Connor, he, uh, you know, he feels the most distant from the family because of that, because he had a different mother, and because his mother was institutionalized. And with Connor, he's also been out of the family business. Like, he left the family business and wants to run for president. Like, that's another thing, is he's running for president. Uh, and I will say, out of all the people in the show that are shown running for president, Connor Roy is, like, the only one that I'd actually vote for. <laughs> um, because he actually at least in what he says, has a lot of views that I do. It's funny, because Connor Roy even tries to insinuate that Logan was an anarcho-capitalist. But Connor is the Fredo of the family. He's the oldest son, but he gets overlooked. He just gets completely passed over on everything. Kendall literally refers to himself as the eldest son multiple times. Uh, and Connor is kind of forgettable early on. As the show progresses, he really grew on me. Like, I love the scenes where he stands up to his siblings about himself. For instance, there's a scene where they're all sitting around discussing stuff, and Kendall's like, as the eldest son, and then Connor's like, I'm the eldest son. I am the eldest son. Uh, and I remember, I'm like, hell yeah, Connor, fucking st stand up for yourself. Because it, it felt good whenever Connor stood up for himself, because uh, it was really sad that he just got overlooked. Like I said, he's the Fredo of this family. And like I said, he's also the most mature, which I think, you know, sadly and ironically comes from this distance he has from the family. Connor also marries a prostitute, but uh, his his marriage is actually far more healthy than Tom and Shiv's. So let's get to Tom and Shiv's. Uh, so Shiv, uh, she's the daughter, the only daughter of Logan Roy. Uh, and uh, they do kind of use her as the, oh, you know, a girl in a man's world commentary, but not as much as you'd think. And another thing about it is she's just as evil and Machiavellian as the other siblings, which I like because a lesser show would have made her like, oh, she's the good one because she's the girl. 
Uh, and they do have moments where they make it seem like she's at least marginally better than her siblings, but even then, she's much more of a snake. They constantly have her be manipulative. She's a terrible wife to Tom. Uh, for instance, uh, she cheats on Tom very early on, and then on the night of their wedding, she tells him that she wants an open relationship. On their fucking wedding night. Uh, she also tells him that she doesn't love him and, like, does this really degrading thing during one of their fucking scenes where they're getting, like, passionate with each other. And she constantly, like, undercuts Tom, too, and it, like, there's points where she literally tries to sell him out, too, for her own self-preservation. So when Tom betrays her at the end of season three to side with Logan against the siblings, it feels earned. You're like, Tom deserves this because fuck Shiv and everything she's done to him. Uh, but then, in season four... When uh, you find out he also betrayed her again to become CEO for Madsen, uh, which, by the way, I went off on a tangent about it, but Mans Madsen wanted to make get an American CEO to appease Jared Mankin once he gets into office uh, to, uh, you know, help dial things down and keep the deal going. Uh, you felt that he earned it. And the thing is, and spoiler, Tom comes out on top in the ending. Tom gets the CEO position uh, because Shiv eventually changes her mind and turns on Kendall because she's the last vote at the end. And again, last minute, Kendall's plan fails, as it always does, because uh, they rush in and they're, you know, they're going to have this vote uh, of whether or not the deal goes through. And it's, you know, it's neck and neck. It's six to six. Shiv is the last vote. And originally she was all in for Kendall. Uh, but then something makes her have a change of heart. We don't know exactly what makes her have a change of heart. Maybe it's because, she, you know, being in the office, seeing Kendall being all chummy with Stewie, she thinks, oh, he's going to start fucking over me again. Uh, or maybe it's because she starts thinking about Kendall just as a leader and how incompetent he is. Because when Kendall and Roman were CEOs in uh, season four... Uh, it does kind of feel like they're just two kids who got the keys to daddy's car and are running amok. So, maybe she thought more about that. Uh, then Kendall, of course, goes to discuss it with her, and it ends up in this big fight between her, Kendall, and Roman, uh, with Roman and Shiv eventually siding against Kendall. And, uh, Kendall actually retracts his, like, confession about killing the fucking waiter. He tries to pass it off as, like, a move, which is fucking cold. Uh, and that, of course, just pushes them all over the edge, where they're like, well, now we're definitely not gonna hear you out. Like, that's, that's what eventually makes Roman turn on him, too. During this whole altercation, Roman actually comes to the realization that they're, they're bullshit, they're not, uh, they're not good successors. You know, they're not serious people, as Logan said. There was this one scene shortly before Logan's death, where Logan goes in and tries to negotiate with the kids early on in season four to try and get them to come over to his side and accept the deal and realize it's a good deal. Uh, and he, you know, he actually apologizes there, because Logan literally never apologized in this series. You never hear him say the words, I'm sorry, until that scene. And it's because of that that I actually think Logan actually was trying to make right with his kids. People might disagree with me on that, but it's literally the only time you ever hear him use the phrase, I'm sorry. And on top of that, He's also, like, he does say that he loves them, and he does want to bring them in and get the family together, and he just wants them to hear him out. Because I think, I think Logan knew he was going to die soon. There's also a scene early on in season four where he's talking about death and, you know, contemplating, you know, do you think there's anything after we die and stuff like that? Like, there's a whole big speech of that. So that's really, uh, I really think that he kind of saw it coming, and I think that he did try to make it right, but he's Logan, he can't just outright do that. So he also had to make it about the deal. I do think, in his own way, Logan was trying to make right, and the only one willing to even hear him out was Connor, which was really sad. That was the last interaction that any of the kids had with him, except for Roman, who actually went to see him shortly after, because Roman also was kind of double-crossing Shiv and Kendall to side with Logan again, right before he died, and then ultimately, uh, that's when he called him and said, you're not just a cunt who's fucking me over, are you? And then that was the last message that he sent to Logan. And something I like about it is we never really get to see, you know, into Logan's head what his actual motivations are, and we actually never get to see whether or not Logan even heard that message. Like, the show intentionally leaves a lot of things ambiguous, and it's for the better. I do think that there are a lot of things that if they were just spelled out, it wouldn't be as good. And it never does any, like, flashbacks or stuff to when they were kids, which is good either, because you get a picture of all that childhood in your head, right? Like, you know, you see the intro where it has, like, the younger versions of them and stuff, but, uh, you don't actually get, like, a dedicated, like, flashback episode, and there's not, like, a flashback in the series, really, so, uh, I think that that's good that it is all left open to you picturing it in your head when they're describing it. But yeah, as you can see, this is a pretty long review. I like a lot of these characters. This show's really good. Uh, another scene I really like was in the episode Too Much Birthday, 
where you see Kendall, like, uh, trying to find a gift that his kids gave him because he doesn't really have a real connection to his kids, and it's fucking heartbreaking seeing him just, like, lose his shit and start, like, going through all the gifts trying to find his gift. Like, all of these characters are tragic in their own ways, and it's fucking great. I love the way the show ends. The show ends with Kendall having tragedy because he loses everything. He can't get in this time. Like, Madsen bought the company. Madsen hates Kendall. Tom's the CEO. Roman has realized, you know, that they never really were contenders, realizing a lot of their life is bullshit. Uh, and then Shiv is, like, stuck in her unhappy marriage with Tom, uh, and, uh, Tom wins. Now, another joke I kept making throughout the series was claiming that Greg was this fucking mastermind who was actually gonna come out on top. And, I mean, Greg does win in the end, too, because Tom actually is able to keep him on, despite the fact that Greg actually double-crossed Tom shortly before it. But yeah, I've gone on and on and on. I think this show is great. Uh, it's my second favorite drama, just under Breaking Bad, but just above Better Call Saul. And it's my second favorite dramedy, just below Moral Oral and just above Red vs. Blue. It is currently my favorite HBO show, with uh, with the second being, uh, you know, the first four seasons of Game of Thrones. Uh, but Succession, thankfully, is actually good throughout. Again, there's a couple of moments I roll my eyes. There's one episode that is a little bit cringe. But the show is fucking fantastic. Goes out on a pretty solid ending. I was rooting for Ken in the end, so obviously I felt it when he lost in the end. But that's so Kendall, right? Kendall always loses without fail. Uh, so, and it felt good for Tom to get the win. I like the tragedy of Kendall. Like, it's like, where the fuck is he gonna go with his life? Like, I legitimately thought Kendall was gonna, like, jump off a balcony or something. He didn't, uh, although there was actually a, a clear attempt to end himself in season three where he, like, uh, fell in the swimming pool and, like, almost drowned. But yeah, I love all these characters, I love the writing, this show's great, and, uh, you should absolutely check it out if you haven't already. Anyway, this has been Fugitive Red Eye, I hope you've enjoyed this fairly long review. Have a good one. Toodles!